Hello, and welcome to Prism of the Past, a weekly series about historical events, people, and situations from the fascinating to the forgotten. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be talking about the Willard Asylum. Every so often, I love digging into a creepy paranormal topic to break up the string of bad businesses and MLMs. So let's get right into it and talk about why this place is known as one of the creepiest places in the United States. And let's see if it really does deserve that title. Let's get into it. The Willard Asylum for the Chronically Insane, as it was called, was originally supposed to be an agricultural college. In 1853, that was what the land was acquired for, and in 1860, the college opened. However, within a few months, the president, as well as many teachers and students, were off fighting in the Civil War. The college was superseded by the new state university and Ithaca, so it never reopened. According to Asylum Projects, soon afterward, the site was earmarked for the Willard Asylum for the Insane, which would represent a second and major step towards transferring responsibility for the care of the mentally ill to the state. From colonial times, the care of insane persons had been a local function. Each county operated a poorhouse or almshouse, wherein indiscriminately lodged a hodgepodge of dependent persons, the mad, the feeble-minded, the aged, the crippled, drunks, epileptics, and beggars. The almshouses provided custody and shelter, but treatment was not in their vocabulary. The first step towards state assumption of responsibility was the opening of the Utica Lunatic Asylum in 1843. Utica was established as a treatment facility. It was reserved for new acute cases and was required by law to return to county custody any patient who was not discharged as recovered within two years. Still condemned to the almshouses were the incurables who, contrary to the unreal expectations of elderly asylum enthusiasts, were the norm among the pauper lunatic class. Dorothea Dix, among others, including the underfunded county superintendents of the poor, drew the legislature's attention to the unspeakable plight of the chronically ill. In other words, treatment and state responsibility was pretty new, not even two decades old when the Willard Asylum opened. In 1864, conditions in these almshouses and jails were investigated and the reports of neglect and abuse spurred on the construction of Willard Asylum. It seemed like 1864 was a turning point and the investigator of this abuse, the same man that wrote the bill calling for the asylum in the first place was Dr. Willard himself, who the asylum was named after. And the asylum couldn't open soon enough. The asylum's first patients who arrived in 1869 were in desperate need of some proper care. The article writes, "'On October 13, 1869, a steamboat docked at Ovid Landing and several men led a deformed, demented woman down the gangplank. Mary wrote, the asylum's first patient had been chained for 10 years without a bed and without clothing in a cell in the Columbia County almshouse. Three more patients, males, arrived at the dock all day, all in irons, one in what looked like a chicken crate, three and a half feet square. Many of early patients had been considered difficult and were quieted by regular flogging, dousing, and pullying, hanging by the thumbs in the Almas houses. Within days of their arrival at the new asylum, however, they were bathed, dressed, fed, and usually resting quietly on the wards. And right now I won't lie, I've got some high hopes for this place. Reading this initially, I want to believe that this place is only labeled as creepy because of the stigma of mental illness and the unsettling vibe of the place, as opposed to how anyone was actually treated. Unfortunately, I think as anyone knows who's been around here for a little bit knows that even companies, organizations, or asylums that start off with fantastic intentions don't always stay that way. From what I can tell, Willard's problem was a double-edged sword type of situation. They were so fantastic that more people were sent there. They built up a good reputation and they grew quickly. But because they grew so quickly, they struggled to keep up. And because they had so many patients, the care they were known for began to fall by the wayside. Even by the end of their first year, they had 700 patients and by 1877, that number doubled. Once their name was changed to Willard State Hospital and its function enlarged to include acute as well as chronic patients, their census hit 2000. Willard grew to have 70 properties in the neighboring areas, and they became known as the largest asylum in the United States. So, hey, credit where credit is due here. It sounded like Willard was helping, or at least trying to help, a lot of people. 
both the person and the asylum, frankly. I'm not saying they were perfect from the very start, but they were a vast improvement than the only alternatives available at that time. Back in those days, Moral treatment was the predominating philosophy to cure the insane. This system was developed in the late 18th century Europe and by Benjamin Rush in the United States. It challenged the demonic explanations for insanity and emphasized the role of environment in determining character. Improper external conditions could induce derangement. The moral treatment system was optimistic that an appropriate environment could facilitate cure, especially for those with acute, not chronic afflictions. Essential to this theory was a psychological basis for mental disorder. Insanity was caused by brain damage. The brain's surface was soft and malleable and physically altered by outward influence. This idea was closely related to phrenology, which assigned specific faculties to sections of the brain. The notion that mental illness resulted from physical impairment was rarely challenged, but the nature and treatment of ailments were continually debated. To find physical evidence for mental deficiencies, autopsies were performed on mental patients to discover lesions or other abnormalities. Although progress was made in the diagnosis of somatic illnesses like tumors or syphilitic endangerment, these efforts were frustrating and subjective. Also controversial was the fate of chronically ill versus acutely ill. The difference between them, whether they should be housed together and whether the chronically ill should be treated at all. I have to admire Willard Asylum for seeing the mentally ill as people in a time when many did not. Though treatment still clearly had a very long way to go, from the sounds of things, they were trying to take steps in the right direction. So where did things go wrong? Why do people call it creepy now? Well, that's where we're going to find next. Thankfully, I dug up the Willem Asylum records from New York State Archives and thanks Asylum Projects for linking that because the history of this place is actually pretty scarce online. But moving on, around 1887, when Willard had over 1500 patients, they began to face some backlash. According to this report, it had been a period of great activity and struggle. Not everyone was in favor of an asylum for the chronically insane. To many, chronic meant incurable and that all hope should be abandoned if a patient went there. This was often true, but the idea was to empty the poor houses and this was being done in spite of resistance from many supervisors of the poor. Then there was a matter of cost. Each patient was a charge against the county from which he or she came. In most cases, cost of care, if it would be called, was cheaper in the almshouse. The cost was for board and shelter. In few cases, there were any provisions for clothing. These terms like chronically insane aren't used today. Just a little reminder here that they are outdated and I am just quoting sources here. But anyway, the point here is that for some of these patients that may have had severe conditions, there was no treatment and there was no getting better as far as current medical like shenanigans were concerned. It's a really sad reality, but I'd like to think that all of you listening can agree with at least the mindset that even if someone has some sort of mental illness or condition that doesn't allow them to take care of themselves, that they do deserve proper treatment. They still deserve to have clean clothes, food, and comfort. And back then, many people simply did not see it that way. It was seen as money wasted. Thankfully, in the early 80s, there were those that actively tried to fix this mindset. A December 1883 article from Elmira Advertiser said that grand good work was being accomplished at Willard and in 1885, 12 incoming members of state legislator visited the asylum and were favorably impressed with their inspection. In 1886, when Willard had 1,800 patients at the time, there were only more good things to say of the supervisors. And in 1887, the State Charities Aid Association of Erie County said that the whole atmosphere of the place was one of peace, quiet, and contentment. And I really, I cannot overstate enough how many inspections were done by different seemingly qualified people and how impressed they all were. The reason I go on and on about this is because I know that with schools or asylums that I have covered, one of the questions I'm often asking myself is why did no one notice? But these inspections detail how the women had four to five dresses, blankets, shawls, hoods, hats, and shoes. The laundry and storerooms were well taken care of and there was well-trained supervision. 
By contrast, at the Erie Asylum at the time, the women were last seen on the ground in a small enclosed space between two houses with no share except that was cast by the buildings, no head coverings, and in many cases without shoes. There were efforts made at Willard for entertainment too and weekly dances. Difficulty did come decades later during the war years because of the shortage of help, but in 1930, one of the buildings was made over into a nurse's ward. Salary increases enticed workers to stay on, and in 1945, the hospital entered into agreements with Cuca and Nazareth colleges, as well as Syracuse and Alfred universities to give students from their nursing schools 12 weeks training in psychiatry. However, make no mistake, behind the scenes, things were changing. According to this report, when the Willard Asylum became the Willard State Hospital upon the passage of the State Care Act, Chapter 126, Laws of 1890, the character of the institution changed markedly. Now, instead of taking only chronic cases from all over the state, acute and chronic cases would be received from its own district. This comprised a large area. There had been little or no provision for acute cases. Now it was a necessity. A combination admission and hospital building would have been ideal, but because of finances, a cheaper solution was sought. Over the years, the powers and authority have shifted from the local level to Albany. The physical health of patients and employees has been a constant concern. For a great many years, there was a five to 7% annual mortality of patients, pulmonary tuberculosis being the number one cause of death. Tuberculosis was a continuing problem. Attempts to segregate the cases were not too successful. In 1902, tent treatment was instituted. Next year, $783.96 was expended for tents. This worked quite well from May to October, but the poor patients were put back into wards, which were less than ideal. Now, I can't and won't fully fault Willard Asylum for a good percentage of the deaths that occurred there because I mean, epidemics happen, people do die. It's a fact of life that if you run a hospital, people will die within those walls. But that isn't the reason why Willard Asylum is marked as creepy. The thing that does make it creepy has been because of the treatments of their patients. In the late 90s, and pretty sure that means the late 1890s, mental disease due to syphilis came to be treated with arsenals and malaria with considerable benefit. After penicillin was in general use, this disease was largely controlled. In 1937, insulin shock treatment and metrazole came into use. A few years later, electroshock was substituted. The treatment in 1948 is summed up by Dr. Keel. After enumerating the various treatments, electric shock, occupational, recreational, hydrotherapy, physiotherapy, and musical treatment, he goes on to say, the outstanding treatment is the kindly and considerate care given by the staff and employees and the good food preparation and service. They tend to show the patient who has frequently been neglected or rejected that people in the hospital are interested in his welfare and thereby restore him to a frame of mind where he is willing and able to discuss his problems and his worries with the psychiatrist and receive suggestions and advice or more tangible assistance as needed. I've got some mixed feelings here. The thing is, I do think that we should be able to call out bad behavior, even if it happened years ago. Dismissing harmful actions because they were normal for the time doesn't make them less harmful. That's how we learn from those actions in the first place, by recognizing that they were wrong. But on the other hand, I don't think this warrants calling Willard Asylum one of the creepiest places on earth. The report that I found was really detailed. They went over everything from any fires on the property to how they got their food to the treatment used to Willard's census. On the final page in the conclusion, yes, the report concedes that because of overcrowding and fewer American physicians drawn to institutional psychiatry after World War II, there may have been under treatment. But this was nationwide, and I don't think Willard crossed the line into abuse. They were a huge humanitarian step forward, so I'd kind of hate to take away from that and pretend like this was some creepy, abandoned, haunted place, when in reality, it simply slowly dwindled and the budget was far less. So then, with all of this taken into consideration, why are they considered so creepy? There were even tours of the place at one point, so clearly people were interested in the old asylum, but why? Is it just the architecture, the ruined hallways and peeling paint? All that's interesting says the following. 
And if you stray too far from the tourist attractions, you may stumble across a certain building that has its own sort of beauty. The Willard Asylum for the Chronic Insane was once a stunning example of mid 19th century architecture. Now the sprawling grounds sit abandoned for the most part. Though nature has begun to reclaim the halls, they still seem haunted by the lost souls who once walked them. Yet further down this article, they also state that Willard wanted to treat patients as opposed to chain them up and keep them in cages. They say, in practice, Willard was as much a prison as a hospital. Patients were kept until the administrators decided they could leave. Many never did. At a time when understanding of mental health was very crude, not everyone who found themselves locked in the asylum was really insane. One of the asylum's most famous patients was Joseph Lobdell, who was committed for a rare form of mental disease, as his doctor puts it. While he had been born a woman, he felt himself to be a man. Today, being transgender is no longer considered grounds for commitment to a mental institution, and Lobdell was certainly not insane. Yet he spent 10 years at Willard before being transferred to another mental hospital where he remained until his death. And it's absolutely fucked up that a transgender person was kept in a mental hospital before passing away. Back then, however, when Willard was built, the standards were unfortunately different. And I'm not trying to dismiss this. The struggle of transgender people and what they have to go through is enormous. And I don't wanna diminish that in any way. Other sites say there's something truly terrifying about Willard Asylum and they write, The hospital was largely self-sufficient and patients routinely helped grow crops and tended livestock on the property. Life at Willard was a mixed bag. The institution offered unheard of opportunities for patients to enjoy themselves, such as a basement bowling alley, a movie theater, and even craft classes. However, there was also a dark side to the activities at Willard. Whole buildings were devoted to electroshock therapy and patients were subjected to freezing ice baths in order to calm them. About 50,000 patients were admitted to Willard Asylum while it operated. About half of them died within the walls of the institution. The Willard Asylum for the Chronic Insane finally closed in 1995. The hospital's cemetery is the final resting place of thousands of unclaimed bodies buried in unmarked graves. After the hospital's closure, cleaning staff stumbled upon hundreds of old suitcases in the attic. They were filled with the personal belongings of former patients, including stuffed animals, lockets, family photos, and journals. Sadly, the contents of many of the suitcases made it clear that quite a few of the patients believed their stay at the asylum would be temporary. These suitcases found at Willard Asylum seem to be the strangest thing and the biggest mystery about the case. There's even an entire website devoted to them with photos of each one. I wouldn't exactly call it creepy or eerie to go through them, maybe just a bit nostalgic in an odd way. Like you can't help but wonder what lives these people had, seeing little glimpses into it and knowing that they were on their way to a mental hospital, perhaps for no good reason at all, maybe because their family couldn't take care of them anymore, who knows? One source explains, when Willard Psychiatric Center in New York's Finger Lakes closed in 1995, workers discovered hundreds of suitcases in the attic of an abandoned building. Many of them appeared untouched since their owners packed them decades earlier before entering the institution. The suitcases and their contents bear witness to the rich, complex lives their owners lived prior to being committed to Willard. They speak about aspirations, accomplishments, community connections, but also about loss and isolation. From the clothing and personal objects left behind, we can gain some understanding of who these people were before they disappeared behind hospital walls. We can picture their jobs and careers, seeing them driving cars, playing sports, studying, writing, and traveling the world. We can imagine their families and friends, but we can also see their lives coming apart due to unemployment, the death of a loved one, loneliness, poverty, or some other catastrophic event. The suitcases and the life stories of those people who own them raise questions that are difficult to confront. Why were these people committed to this institution and why did so many stay for so long? How were they treated? What was it like to spend years in a mental institution shut away from a society that wanted to distance itself from people it considered insane? Why did most of these suitcase owners live out their days at Willard? What about their friends and families? Are the circumstances today any better than they were for the psychiatric patients during the first half of the 20th century? To answer a few of those questions, I do truly believe that many of the people in Willard were simply given up on by society, but I think they were treated better than many patients at the time. I can't imagine what it must've been like to be shut away from the world like that. And I'm grateful that I don't have to imagine that. 
I think we are beginning to make some great strides in the mental health community with so much being done to promote awareness. We are far from perfect, but we've also come a long way too. So all in all, yeah, this place looks really freaky when you're looking at all the photos and the cemetery on the grounds sure does not help even if all the evidence point to the deaths being natural causes. In the same way a graveyard or an abandoned building has an eerie unsettling charm, I think Willard Asylum does too. But at the same time, I don't want anyone walking away from this viewing Willard Asylum as a horrific place out of American Horror Story. They absolutely had their problems, I won't deny that. I just wouldn't group them in with some of the other truly terrible places we've talked about. After all, some of the photos people took on tours in the past, and I say in the past because it seems like they closed tours in 2016, seem to be a lot more cheery, or at the very least show a bowling alley and what looks like a movie room, as opposed to just abandoned peeling walls and uncomfortable looking chairs. But anyway, with all of that being said, that's where we're going to end today's episode of Prism Into the Past. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you did, make sure you're liking, following, and subscribing so that you can stay up to date on all the latest episodes. And if you want to connect with me outside of these episodes, make sure to click my Linktree link in the description box. It will have all of my social media, my Discord server, other projects I'm involved with, all that good stuff will pop up in a neatly organized link. So again, thank you all so much for making it to another episode and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.